deepened by learning about the land. Um, so we want to take the moment to pause and acknowledge the deep connection of the Mohegan people to this land, which is their historic homelands. They lived and cared for what we now call the Berkshires and well beyond for thousands of years before Europeans forcibly seized their lands. Today, their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. And these lands continue to be of significance to the Mohegan people. There are numerous ways that you can learn more about this history and deepen your connection to these lands. And we'll send some resources in the follow-up email. Great, thank you so much, Charlotte. Um, now we just kind of want to talk about the recipe for brilliant autumn colors. Um, I know if you're, I saw someone is in the UK, so thanks so much for zooming in. You probably haven't seen the transitions happening in the Berkshires right now, but things are happening. And the three main ingredients that really lead to spectacular fall color are um, diversity of tree species, the weather needs to be pretty specific, and uh, the landscape plays a big deal. So in New England, we have tons of tree and shrub species that have the potential to turn really vibrant colors. We have our hickories that offer that yellow and gold color, our striped and silver maples that are also yellow. Um, the American beech offers that nice bronze brownish color. Um, our white and red oaks are reddish brown. Big tooth aspen are reddish brown. Same with flowering dogwoods. The white ash um, bring in that purple, red, orange. So we're seeing less and less of those. Um, we have sugar maples that really give that orange to red pop that New England is known for. Um, and then in our wetlands, we see a lot of um, diversity in shrub species. So dogwood and spice bush um, offer some great popping colors. And um, in the in the forest, sometimes we see hobble bush, which can be purple. It's a nice low shrub. Um, so in terms of ideal weather, summer plays um, a big role in fall colors. Adequate summer rains promote really good tree health, leaf retention, and therefore color produc production during fall. Um, the right weather this time of year can promote more intense color production as well. So those bright reds we really like require sunlight for production of that color. Um, it's actually enhanced by cold and sunny days. If we experience rain or windy weather during um, autumn, it can knock the leaves down prematurely and shorten the color display right when it's at its peak. So um, we like for the weather to cooperate. And um, here in the Berkshires, we do have the ideal landscape. We have a blend of deciduous trees. So those trees we just mentioned where the leaves are falling off every year, but they're changing colors, but also coniferous trees um, are, are also known as evergreen trees. So they're staying green, offering that great contrast. Um, and we have you know, the Taconic Mountains and the Berkshire Hills and the river valleys, which offer great backdrops for looking at, um, at fall colors. So that's really it for um, the main ingredients. I think it's gonna be a really nice year for fall colors and we're starting to see that transition happen already. Done. Okay, so um, I think Charlotte, I will pass it off to you now. Um, so today we're gonna go through some new and improved reserves trails that, that the NRC has. Um, and then we'll turn to some classics, the well-known and well-loved spots, um, and then some that are a little less known. And I'm gonna start off with um, Parsons Marsh, I think. Oh, yes, there it is. Um, so Parsons Marsh um, is a, it's a short, short trail. It's one way. It's an accessible trail that starts out with gravel and then transitions to a boardwalk. Um, it goes through a beautiful meadow with a, with a pollinator garden, past a, a lovely pond where we saw um, some beaver and there is also evidence of otter there. Um, we saw, I think it was, maybe it was a baby beaver. No, probably not, it was too early in the season, but um, that was just this past summer. It came really close, close to us. Um, and uh, some 
Other nice features include really large old growth, or not old growth technically, but big trees um, that you can get really up close to on the boardwalk. Um, and then of course, the, the wetland and the marsh itself um, offers an amazing variety of um, birding opportunities and also um, just some interesting wetland uh, loving native plants. Um, and this past season, we, um, or BNRC stewardship staff, um, reestablished the dam um, that was, uh, I think, causing some, it was, it was an old dam, um, and restored the original spillway. Um, they also worked to remove invasive plants, and then we had our volunteers come in and um, plant some, some native plants to restore the habitat around the dam site. That was really exciting for me, at least. Um, we got some, some beautiful natives, including cardinal flower. If you're familiar with it, it's got these really bright red, red flowers that come out um, towards the end of the summer when not as much is, is blooming. Um, some turtle head, also a, a wet wetland loving um, plant and um, asters, of course. And um, we hope that these natives will just further establish a, a strong embankment to the pond and help it protect against future erosion, um, as well as, of course, provide habitat for, for little critters. So I'm going to pass it off to you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Charlotte. So our next um, adventure will be at the Old Mill Trail, where that upcoming hike is taking place. The Old Mill Trail is a reserve of 127 acres. There are three miles of trail there in total. And the first half, half of the trail was built to be um, an accessible trail. So friendly to um, wheelchair, stroller, and mobility aids. Um, I will say currently this section is not uh, deemed wheelchair accessible uh, due to the parking area, but BNRC has begun the permitting and planning process to fix these issues. Um, but along the trail, as you can see in the picture, you're going to see the east branch of the Housatonic River. It's deemed a cold water fishery, so very healthy section of the stream. Um, and along the way, you'll find some dogwood with some brilliant red color and sugar maple, that great golden color. Um, you can see that, that big boulder, probably a glacial erratic with the nice golden leaves in the background. And what is new and improved about this trail this year? Something very exciting. Um, BNRC's trail crew is working to restore the original accessibility of the Old Mill Trail. It's about, um, I think, an over 10 years old at this point. I think maybe it's 11 years old now and had seen a lot of um, just wear and tear over the years. So this included bridge approach updates, culvert rehabilitation, and resurfacing sections of the trail surface. Um, and there's a great before and after picture of a tricky um, stone crossing and um, just increasing the accessibility of this reserve. So next up is Basin Pond which is not necessarily new as far as being a reserve, but it is improved. And I think Basin Pond might be the biggest underrated BNRC reserve in that I think people forget about Lee. It's sort of off in an Eastern corner of the Berkshires and, and not on the main North South path. So uh, it, it's sneaky good. Um, it's about 300 acres. And there's two and a half miles of trails that you'll find here. It has some terrific rock features and it has a great overlook where you can see beaver activity and the habitat that the beaver have created there. It's also adjacent to October Mountain State Forest, which is something like 16,500 acres. So even though what BNRC owns and operates is a 300 acre parcel, the wildlife and the um, the habitat that you'll find here plays much bigger than a 300 acre reserve. And on the next slide, you see some of the improvements that have happened at Basin Pond. These stream crossings were really tricky, um, especially uh, for those who um, aren't as agile as we used to be. 
And so um, we've created some stream crossings that are a little bit more steady than just balancing as on rocks as you go across the stream, which has made this reserve something that many, many more people can use. And then you can see here the uh, BNRC crew is moving big stones and heavy bridge materials with this grip hoist where cables are affixed around these large trees, which enable safe placement and movement of these objects. So using straps and hooks, each support was uh, carefully listed, lifted into its resting place, as you can see. So it's a lot easier to move around at Basin Pond now. So if you uh, are looking for a, a great underrated reserve, this is a good place to check out this autumn. So moving on to some BNRC classics um, reserves that are, are well known and, and loved, we have the Hoosick Range Reserve all the way up in North Adams. Um, it's nearly a thousand acres and it's also bordering Savoy Mountain State Forest. Um, it has six miles of trails and they range from easy to difficult. So you can hike up to Sunset Rock, which is just one and a half miles and an easy, easy hike for a big reward, um, which is the lookout that you see in this picture to the left. Um, as its name suggests, it has a really spectacular west facing view um, for, for a good sunset watch. Um, and if you want a more difficult hike, you can continue up along the ridgeline to Spruce Hill uh, for an even more dramatic vista. It's really spectacular, nearly 360 degrees. Um, and especially at this time of year when you can look down and see all of the, the trees changing color. Um, the trees here are also um, interestingly shaped because it's so, it's, pretty high in elevation and they've just been gnarled by, by the wind and the elements. Um, really, really special place. Awesome, thanks Charlotte. I'll also mention a new bench was installed at uh, yeah, Sunset right. Rock this year. Um, so another new. All right, so um, I'm gonna talk briefly about the high road, um, Yoke and Ridge and connecting trails. If you're not familiar, the High Road is a long-term initiative of BNRC that is made possible by generous donors and land partners. It's primarily a route for recreation for hikers, um, but it also complements many types of outdoor recreation while also supporting local businesses that serve visitors and residents. The goal is to link town to town and town to trail, um, and hopefully significantly broadening out their access for all of the Berkshire communities. Um, so BNRC and its partners opened the first segment of the High Road in 2021, um, and it encompasses an eight mile path along Yokan Ridge, which is that predominant ridge from Pittsfield to um, Stockbridge. If you're driving down Route 7 um, heading south, it's on your right. Um, and so Mahana Cobble is the northern section of the route and starts at Bosque Mountain. Um, it's in purple right there. I'm not sure if you can see that very well. Um, I think perhaps we accidentally <laughs> duplicated um, the, the Yokan seat and Lennox Mountain. So this first one here should say uh, Mahana Cobble. But um, Mahana Cobble is 222 acres, um, 2.8 miles of trail out and back, if you're just doing out and back and not continuing along the ridge. It is considered difficult, and that's primarily because of the elevation change in the first part of the hike, you're hiking up a ski slope. It's an easy ski, the easiest of the ski slopes, but a ski slope nonetheless. Um, but all along the way, um, you will see shagbark hickories, which give off this incredible golden color. Um, and at the top, you get uninterrupted views south over Kennedy Park, Pleasant Valley Wildlife Sanctuary, and Yokan Ridge. Um, if you choose to head back down the mountain from that vista, um, you'll get a bird's eye view of Pittsfield and the North Berkshires looking out to Mount Greylock. And um, so it's well worth it in both directions and dogs are required on leash um, for this section, but they are allowed. 
Um, so if you continue along the Yokin Ridge Trail, you'll, you'll arrive at Yokin Seat and Lennox Mountain, which is on uh, Mass Audubon's reserve um, or wildlife sanctuary. And this offers expansive western facing views looking at the Taconic Mountains and the Richmond Valley. Um, from there, you could connect down to Pleasant Valley Wildlife Sanctuary if you'd like. Um, no dogs are allowed on, on that section, though. Um, and if you can decide to continue even farther along the ridge or just want to access this trail system from the south, you can do so at Yokin Ridge South. Um, it's fairly popularly known for Olivia's Overlook, but there are a number of different access points there. Um, that reserve is 734 acres and features Monk's Pond, which is a great spot to take pictures of the fall colors. There's six miles of trails there. They're all considered moderate. Um, and you'll find witch hazel about to start blooming, which is fantastic. I love that we have a fall blooming shrub that we can look forward to. They're nice little um, beautiful small yellow flowers. Um, and the forest type there is northern hardwood, um, hemlock, and white pine forest. So you get that contrast that we talked about early in the program. Um, and there's also great views even from the parking area. Olivia's Overlook, um, you get a great shot of the Stockbridge Bowl. All right, so next up is Bob's Way in Monterey. It's one of my favorite BNRC reserves all times of year. It's particularly beautiful in the autumn. It's 263 acres. It is two and a half miles of trails in a you remember what the number eight looked like on a 1980s digital calculator. The trails are sort of laid out like that. So you can really affect how long you're there and how long you're on the trails. You know, you can spend two hours around the outer loop or you can cut it to a quick 45 minute walk if you want to. Um, something that, you know, I think is a great thing to do at Bob's Way is uh, to go down to the Beaver Marsh, which is pictured here. You can see it. Go there, you know, not long after sunrise or not long before sunset um, and uh, just sit there. And after 30 or 45 minutes, I expect things are going to start to happen and you'll just get to observe. You'll get to probably see some great wildlife. It's a nice way to spend some time at Bob's Way. There's mountain laurel. There's great contrast with hobble bush. There's maples, birch, oak and beech. And... This particular reserve is named for um, Bob Terriot, who was a renowned conservationist who passed away in the late 1990s and left a great deal of conservation land and a, a great deal of funding for conservation for the Berkshires. So we're very glad to name this reserve in Bob's honor. Okay, so here we have Hollow Fields, which is in Richmond. I love this reserve um, in all seasons, but in the fall in particular, um, is the show of goldenrods, the asters, and milkweed. Huh? It looks like someone, oh, here we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, we got the goldenrods and asters, um, which make you know, a beautiful combination of colors. Um, and then there's also milkweed, which is going to seed right now. Um, it's almost 700 acres, um, and it's got a variety of trails, some of which go through the field that you're seeing here, and then others going through the woods. Um, there's a great vista just by walking a little bit up the, um, the meadow trail, but also if you continue up um, to per Perry's Peak. Um, and then there's a very, this is a very popular trailhead, so um, the parking lot can be full at some times um, and you want to be be conscious um, that you're not parking on the on the road there. Um, but you can find another close by option by using the BNRC trails app, which we'll talk a little bit about later on in the presentation. All right, so heading south a little bit, Thomas and Palmer Brook and Great Barrington. 267 acres with um, a half mile meadow loop trail that is accessible. Um, so it has a gentle slope and gravel surface. 
Um, it gives you great views of not only the meadow, but this wetland complex with large sugar maple pasture trees. You can see here in the photo, you catch it at the magic hour. It just feels so good. Um, and then in the field, there's goldenrod. So um, it's probably starting to go on its way out right now, but you'll get some nice um, yellow colors from that. And then milkweed as well. You'll probably find a lot of milkweed pods opening up and spreading their seed right now. Um, but also that means in the spring and summer, you'll see uh, monarch activity, monarch butterfly activity there. Um, there's also a great stream that has some uh, beaver activity and a pond as well. So some nice water features to check out. Um, and then there is a new last year, two mile out and back um, woodland trail that leads to the Whale Rock Trail. Um, the trail gradually cl climbs in elevation to a unique rock feature locally known as Whale Rock. Um, Whale Rock is home to sensitive and unique habitats and um, it's just a great feature. You, you get there and you don't get a great um, view all around, but the feature in and of itself is worth the climb. Um, and all along the way, you'll be walking through hardwood forests with chestnut, oak, birch, and cherry trees. So great diversity of species and um, a good amount of mountain laurel in the understory as well. Before I hop into Alford Springs, we have a great question in the chat that I wanted to bring up. Um, do you find as a general rule, some types of trees turn first? I was in Canada for two falls and something smallish and gloriously red started to the show. Interesting. I think, I don't know a lot of the science around this, Charlotte, I don't know if you were unmuted to, to answer the question, but, um, you know, scientifically, it means that some are just breaking down the chlorophyll faster than it's being um, manufactured. So it could mean that the tree is under some type of stress or something. But um, I, I think I, I think oaks change later and, and maples change earlier. I don't know. If, <laughs> Charlotte, do you have an idea of that? I don't have have much to add to that. Um... Yeah, We're based gonna... on my personal experience, um, that's been the case of, of maples turning sooner. Um, also, beaches generally. I've also noticed like wet, wet um, trees in wetland areas yeah. tend to change yeah. earlier too. Um, we'll look this up. Changing. Yeah, that's true. Way. Yeah. Um, we'll definitely yeah. look this up and, and get back to you all um, in our follow up resources because yeah. I'm, I'm interested as I well. Could... Delia says, could it be euonymus um, bush? So winged euonymus is, uh, is also called burning bush because of its incredibly gloriously red um, leaves in the fall. And it, it's, a, it's a shrub, um, not a tree, but um, it's also a non-native. So it, it spreads aggressively and um, is not great for the, for the uh, native habitat, but um, is pretty. What I'm most keyed into are maple. And so that's what I notice the most, um, partly because I've got a maple in my front yard. <clears throat> and when it starts to color up, I start thinking to myself, like, enjoy it, brother, because it's almost over. <laughs> and like, I mean, I love winter, too, but it's a different kind of enjoyment. Um, but I also notice that I, because I'm keyed into maples, I notice that maples go at different times, you know, which tells me that there's something about um, on-site environment. Um, you know, close to water, not close to water, et cetera. Um, so, so much to know out there. Um, yeah. Thanks for that. So Alford Springs is um, <clears throat> the place where um, I once thought many years ago that maybe it would be fun to work for BNRC someday. And uh, so it has a special place in my heart. It is in the Southern Berkshires on the Western edge. It is a big woods reserve, about 900 acres. Uh, is it 900 or 1,000? 899, it's about 900 acres. It's terrific for fall colors because there's a great contrast of forest types here. You've got white pine and hemlock stands mixed in with Northern hardwoods. And so a really great show here. There are trail systems here, three main trails um, that you can spend 90 minutes to the better part of a day on, depending on what sort of trip you're up for. There are three uh, trailhead accesses. Um, two of them are relatively close together on the southern end of this reserve. 
And if you're going to one of those two Southern accesses, one of which is only a three season access, if you've never been here before, you're, you might doubt yourself as you're getting close. You might think like, is there really something out here where I can park my vehicle and go into a reserve? And there definitely is. If you're doubting yourself, you're in the right place. The Northern access is much easier to find relatively speaking on country roads um, because that one you're just going on West Road and Alford and then around the Scribner Book, Brook Farm kind of between Alford and West Stockbridge you'll see the sign on the side of the road and that's where you can get into this reserve. A really great place if you're looking to disappear in the woods for the better part of the day this is a great place to do it in autumn. Oh and I meant to say if you're on the father loop here you can get on a clear day, you can get a really great view of Greylock Mountain, even though you're, you know, about as far from it as you can be and still be in the Berkshires. Um, the view is that good from the, the Father Loop Trail High Point. People top. Um, another one of my favorites, I say that about every reserve, but it really is um, a special place. And um, I'm excited to visit it tomorrow, actually. It's 1,200 acres around there, um, and it's BNRC's second largest reserve. Um, up until very recently, it was in first place as the largest reserve, um, and it's bordered by other conserved land, so it just makes for great wildlife habitat, especially for, for larger mammals. Um, and it's it also has a lot of varied habitats. Um, it's got the, those wetlands that you can see in the, in the picture above. Um, it's got meadows, it has hardwood forests, coniferous forests, um, and also a, a range of, of, of tree age, um, which makes for interesting dynamics. Um, there's a lot of sugar maple and red maple, and also some red oak and birch, um, all of the good stuff for, for colors. And um, this reserve is out in New Marlboro, um, which means it's it's less visited, which is kind of nice if you like a more solitary experience. Um, but it's also a um, popular hunting spot around this time of year. So do make sure to wear blaze orange if you're if you're going out there to to enjoy it. Um, oh, and I, I didn't talk about the the trails. So it has five miles of marked trails um, and. I think a little over three miles of unmarked trails um, that are old woods roads with a lot of interesting historical remnants like stone walls and, and cellar holes. Um, so just lots of opportunity for, for exploration at Steeple Top. Okay, so now we're moving on to the less trodden reserves. And up first is a reserve called Widow White in Lanesboro. Um, this reserve does not have any marked trails. Um, if you navigate your way there, you will find a kiosk um, that has some information on the panel. It shows the existing woods roads, so you can venture along those knowing that they are not marked. Um, it has a really dense canopy of northern hardwoods, so like we've talked about already, a lot of variety of colors from that. And also some really interesting rocky outcrops. There are some um, smaller caves on this reserve, but just um, a lot of rocky outcrops because of that, which gives a good contrast as well. It's 270 acres total um, and also is a really great spot to see spring ephemeral wildflowers. Um, it's hard to think about spring right now, but had to give that a shout out. Next up, you can hit the water in the autumn if you want to at Ashmere Island, which is a seven acre island reserve that BNRC takes care of in Ashmere Lake. So the way that you access this is you have to go to the public boat launch at Ashmere State Forest. The lake sits right between Hinsdale and Peru, Massachusetts in the Eastern Berkshires. And from the boat launch, you're going to do a 45 minute paddle. You're gonna go underneath the causeway and keep going until you hit the island. There's hemlock and red maple out here. And uh, if you're up to uh, pump those arms, and uh, get yourself out to the island, maybe with a sandwich or a picnic basket or something like that. It's a, a nice way to make some memories on an autumn morning. 
also uh, to another body of water. Um, we have St the Stedman Pond Reserve, which is in Tiringham in Monterey. Uh, there's only a very short maintained trail here through, through a meadow that leads to Stedman Pond itself. Um, but it's a, a beautiful place for a beautiful place to swim in the summer. Maybe if you're a fall swimmer, you can do that too. Um, and there is a spectacular backdrop of, um, of, the, of the steep, I don't know if you could call it a mountain, but um, a little bit of a mountain in the background um, that, that makes it worth a visit um, in its own right. And there are some unmarked woods roads here too, if you are um, the adventurous type. And yeah, and uh, oh, no, go, go ahead. ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, I was just going to say we've done we've done more work here recently in terms of conservation, right? Um, so BNRC collaborating with a bunch of other partners um, like Massachusetts Fish and Game, Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation, the Monterey Preservation Land Trust, Bidwell House, just so many great friends in this area collaborated to recently conserve about 800 acres, which then sort of filled in a donut hole of 14,000 conserved acres. So there's just ton of conserved land here. It's a nice big conservation corridor. And you know, these corridors are great for wildlife migration so that the animals can move around for climate resiliency, for carbon storage. Uh, so a really great example in Stedman Pond of a slice of a bigger conservation corridor that, that really exemplifies best practices in terms of landscape scale conservation, a, a project we are proud to be a part of with all those other partners. And so there's just a few other people here we can unmute um, if you're so inclined, if you have other spots that we missed that you want to call out because you generously want to share them instead of keeping them to yourself, feel free to do so. Can be BNRC reserves or otherwise. Yes, exactly. Everybody wants to keep secrets today. Mariah and Rich, do you have any favorites? Yeah. I don't know if I want to tell people, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's always hard to pick favorites, I think. Um, mm. I really love Field Farm in Williamstown. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a trustees of reservation reserve, um, but they get, get a big field <laughs> with the forest edge around, and I just love that that contrast of habitats. Um, yeah, I think Housatonic Flats in Great Barrington is another great fit. That is yeah, the NRC Reserve, one. but you get some good views of the river there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking of um, if you want a pulse pounding hike up a mountain, um, there's Mount Darby and Mount Washington which of course you could pair with going to some non-BNRC um, reserves in that area. You know, there's the Everett Mountain Reserve on the Appalachian Trail, just a few miles down the road, and the Mount Washington State Forest, which is around that area too. But the BNRC Reserve specifically, Mount Darby, you can um, climb up Mount Darby. Um, and then at the top, you can do drop down um, into some uh, beaver wetlands and you know, I always just love setting up on on beaver wetlands. They're such um, beaver are such amazing creatures, but they create such great wildlife habitats for so many things to see. So, like I said before, kind of with Bob's way, I just like to go in a place like that and get quiet and see what happens after about thirty or forty five minutes of sitting. It's amazing who will come out and play if you just allow that sort of quiet time to to happen. Thanks, Rich. We had a great comment from Polly. Um, it's quite nice where I live, especially in my own small food forest garden. I love That's that. Great. And Polly's in Derbyshire Peak District, UK. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, Jim shared Shepherd's Well near Petersburg Pass and Stony Ledge on Greylock. Oh, yes. Really great options. So we just have a few more slides for you. Um, I think this is you too, Rich. <laughs> oh, yeah. So there's 58 of these reserves to explore. You can go to bnrc.org slash reserves. 
and you'll see all of them and you can check them all out. Uh, you can download the BNRC Berkshire Trails app uh, for your mobile device to check them all out. This is all thanks to donors and volunteers um, BNRC is donor funded. So none of this happens, the conservation, the wildlife protection, the support of farmers, the climate resilience that we build, the free access to the Berkshire outdoors, all these places are free to go. That's all because of donors and they're all cared for with volunteer help. There's so many acres of BNRC reserve land to care for that if we did not have our volunteer core, we would be totally sunk and we wouldn't know what to do. So big thank you to the volunteers too. Thanks so much. And uh, we just wanted to start wrapping up with a couple of tips of what to bring. If you are a beginner hiker and want to get out this fall, um, definitely having a day backpack doesn't have to be anything fancy, just a backpack. Staying hydrated is super important in all seasons, but especially as we get into the colder seasons and, and water just doesn't sound great, you got to keep chugging it to stay hydrated. Um, so we recommend at least two liters if you're planning to go out for a couple miles. Um, snacks or meals are really important too. Um, sturdy footwear, again, it doesn't have to be anything fancy or even hiking boot specific, but just some nice footwear to support your ankles and all that good stuff. Um, layers are super important. We recommend, you know, wool or synthetic layers. They're much better than cotton um, because if you're sweating, it's going to wick that moisture away from your body and keep you warm. Um, a rain layer is also nice, especially how rainy it's been. Um, I want you to think about tick safety. Um, it definitely shouldn't be something that keeps you from being in the woods, but something um, you want to be prepared for. So staying on the trail can be helpful to prevent um, ticks. Wearing light color colored clothing is another good prevention trick. So you can just see them easier. And tucking in so you can tuck your pants into your socks and your shirt into your pants. Um, some folks recommend carrying like a lint roller around with you in your car, especially. So before you get in, you could just roll over in case you have any on you and then check, check, check. We just can't reiterate that enough. Um, other things you might want to bring map and compass at all of the BNRC reserves, uh, with the exception of Ashmere Island and um, I guess Widow White too. We do have trifold trail maps that are available at each trailhead. Again, shout out to our volunteers for keeping those stocked, um, as well as kiosk information panels. Um, first aid, first aid kits and supplies, very important to bring with you. Um, trekking poles can be helpful, especially if you're climbing elevation that really saves a lot of pressure on your knees. And um, wearing blaze orange, I know Charlotte mentioned hunting season already. Um, just about every BNRC reserve is open to hunting as subject to Massachusetts state regulations. So I'm gonna pump it, um, put the uh, hunting season dates into the chat, um, just so you have that available to you. Uh, shotgun season is the one you really wanna be careful about. There's more hunters in the woods during that time, but, um, Hunters are, are very knowledgeable about where the hiking trails are and considerate of that sort of thing. So um, just keep that in mind. And there is no hunting in, on Sundays in Massachusetts. Here's a list of some other handy additional items um, if you're interested in, in having a little more fun outside. Um, apps can be really fun. There's some great apps called Seek. Um, allows you to hover your camera over and it'll pop up what... Um, plant or tree that it thinks it is. Uh, it works for caterpillars too, I just found out yesterday, um, and insects, that sort of thing. And it might even work for scat um, if you try that out. And what else? Um, binoculars, your favorite field guides, um, GPS. I know Rich, you often use a GPS unit just to have fun outside. Yeah, I, I didn't think I ever needed it until I used it for the first time. And then I was angry that I had spent so many years of my life not using it. It's just a fun way to locate where you are in the landscape, in the topography, to see what's around the bend without necessarily going around the bend and deciding if you want to go further. It also will track your path. And so I can just turn it on when I leave the truck. And uh, then I know that if I venture off trail, if that's something that I choose to do, I can always rely on the unit to find my way back. And it's satellite driven rather than um, mobile signal driven. 
And so it, it works even where there's no mobile service. You still have to take personal responsibility for knowing that any device could fail you at any time. But I, I found a Garmin GPS to be a fun toy to play with in the woods. Um, not necessary, but a, but a fun toy. Awesome, thank you. Okay. So I'm not sure who was meant to speak about this, but I'm happy to jump in and say that our learn page, bnrc.org slash learn has a ton of resources to further your learning. We have a, a whole list of recommended field guides and books, the apps and websites to um, create a more accessible outdoor space. Um, there are documentaries, regional and county trail maps, um, a lot of resources around diversity, equity, inclusion, access, and belonging, if you're interested in learning more about the NRC's um, values around that. And, um, and two new publications, they were new as of, I guess, earlier this year and one last year, but the Everybody Can Hike Guide is available on our website and we'll share in the follow-up email. It's meant for beginners to the outdoors to tell you all the things you need to have a fun, safe, and educational um, time outside, as well as some tips on how to find places to go visit. And then the Berkshire County Trails for All brochure, which is a summary of um, some of the accessible trails in Berkshire County. Um, all right, so let's see here. I think we have some fun things. There's a shout out to the BNRC Berkshire Trails app that Rich mentioned earlier. And um, we'll wrap it up with some stuff to look for from Charlotte. All right, so we've already mentioned some of these things, um, of course trees and their beautiful leaf colors um, but there are some other exciting things happening in the natural world right now in the fall um, as as all of the the critters and plants and us prepare prepare for the for the winter um, so some flowers are just now flowering like aster and goldenrod um, which is a beautiful combination as i said um, before and you can see in this bottom right photo um, other, most other flowers and plants are coming to the end of their life cycle and producing fun fruits and seeds. Um, you'll see a lot of yeah, interesting colors and, and variation um, if you look closely in, in those. Um, at the bottom left, that's um, cucumber root. And it's got these nice little bright blue berries at the top. Um, and there's fall bird migration. It doesn't get as much attention or press as uh, the spring bird migration, perhaps because um, birds are kind of getting a little duller in their, in their appearance um, as they come out of the mating season. But um, it's happening. Uh, there are millions of birds flying over our heads at night. Um, and something to look out for is large groups of migrating hawks, specifically the broad-winged hawk, um, can, can form groups of up to like thousands of birds, um, which is pretty spectacular. I've never seen it personally, but um, it's, on my, it's on my bucket list. Um, and of course, fungi, fungi is proliferating. Um, you can see the, the fruiting bodies of mushrooms everywhere. Um, this whole summer has really been an amazing um, summer to, to find fun fungi um, but it's yeah it's still still continuing um, to happen around us um, this one here is called the bear's tooth fungus um, and it's it's different in that it's got these kind of icicle shaped um, spore bearing parts Mariah, that's the yeti yeah <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good mm -hmm. comparison. I like oh, that also, name for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's hobblebush here in the in the right um, uppermost corner, which we mentioned a few times. Um, it's it turns you know that kind of it looks it looks more red here, but um, but often I see it as a as kind of a dark purple. All right. Thank you so much. Um, we'll open the floor to questions if anyone has any, whether in putting into the chat or just feel free to unmute yourself.
And if nobody has questions, I'll just say, I hope we see you out on the trail. We're always here if you have any questions. Um, <laughs> um, Polly wants to know what the Yeti is. Um, and uh, I think I think she's referring to um, the, the mushroom we saw in the last photo, which is called the bear's tooth fungus. Um, yes. It's related to lion's mane, which is better known for its um, medicinal properties. Are they both edible? Do you know? They are both edible, yes. And you can't mistake it for anything else, really. Um, <laughs> there's, there's no, you know, poisonous version of it. It's definitely the right one if you if you see it fantastic all right well thank you all for joining and we'll send a follow-up email with um, some resources to what we talked about today all right we'll see you next time thanks so much okay thanks everyone for being here take care